Professor Dwayne Bratt, who is a political scientist at Mount Royal University, co-authored an op-ed last week about the Take Back Alberta movement or group in that has played a very has been very influential in the rise of Premier Dan Smel, Danielle Smith within the United Conservative Party. And he had some very interesting things to say that I want to talk to him about. So welcome to the interview, Dwayne. Happy to be here, Markham. Can you tell us who is Take Back Alberta and why were why did you write the op-ed? So Take Al Take Back Alberta is a third party group, a political action committee, as it were, uh, that is heavily involved in conservative politics in Alberta. Uh, they were involved in organizing the anti Kenny vote in his leadership review. They then mobilized in support of Daniel Smith during her leadership race. Um, they now occupy half of the UCP board. Uh, they, they took that over at the AGM. Half the seats uh, go in every year, and they put a slate together, and they won every seat. They have taken over riding uh, association boards, and they uh, their endorsed candidates are now winning nomination races right across the province. This is a very significant political force. Um, and I think the novel feature of what they're doing is Alberta has a tendency of creating new parties, uh, particularly on the right. They get unhappy. Uh, with the, the leftward drift of every party, uh, and they go and form their own party. This time, they haven't done that. Instead, they've decided to take over an existing party, um, which I think is a really interesting strategy. And we wrote it because I don't think the average Albertan understands what is going on here. They have a very radical agenda, but they're very good at organizing. And it doesn't take a lot of people in a particular constituency association to control their board or to control the nomination or to have a candidate win. It's much tougher in a general election, which is why third parties uh, or new parties have real challenges. So they've figured that out. And I think Albertans need to know who this party has become. Well, I run across uh, Take Back Alberta on Twitter all the time, and uh, the head of the organization, David Parker, is a very interesting character. I've seldom met an activist, a political activist like that, who's as cocky and arrogant. I don't know how else to say it, Dwayne. Yeah. I mean, he, no, he's, he, he's cocky, he's arrogant, he's also very good at what he does. Um, and you know, just the string of successes that I've rattled off uh, is testament to that. Um, and, you know, people have shown up to these events and you've got 150 or 200 people in, in a, a room and they're just captivated by his uh, speaking style. And so um, they've, they've figured out that the funding that they're getting, we can talk about the funding in, in a moment, this isn't aimed at election advertising. Uh, there are certain rules, even for third-party advertisers on what they can and cannot do. Instead, they're using those funding in different ways. Get out the vote uh, patterns, uh, winning nominations, advertising on um, uh, alternative right-wing media, for example, um, which isn't necessarily endorsing a candidate, but the editorial stances of those uh, outlets support what they're doing. So there's some really creative things that that David Parker and, and others are, are doing here. Uh, and as I said, um, we need to understand who these candidates are and who they're beholden to. Uh, at one point, after they they uh, in their drive to capture the UCP board, they said that that now makes them the boss of the premier, you know. And uh, I, I did a series of interviews. And I said, no, that's not that's not the case. We need to separate the party apparatus from the government apparatus. But they believe that once they have controlled the party, then the premier cabinet are now under their their control. Uh, and there was a sense that. The pre-existing board, Symphony Moore, who's the president of the party and others, were in the pocket of, of Jason Kenney, and they want to reverse that. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I've seen Parker, he didn't use exactly this language, but he, the, the sense that he leaves you with is that 
uh, is uh, Premier Danielle Smith is a marionette and he's the puppet master. Yeah, uh, w without a doubt, he's saying that. And uh, as I said, Parker is good at what he does, but he could not get himself elected. Uh, but that's not what he's trying to do. He wants to be the power be behind the throne and, uh, and, and put Smith forwards, put other candidates forward, and he's behind the, uh, behind the scenes. And I think we need to pull back the curtain to see who some of these people are. And they've got a great slogan, you know, change politics from the inside. And as I said, instead of creating you know, the Wild Rose Independence Party or the Maverick Party or the Buffalo Party or, you know, the Western Canada Concept Party. We can go down the list, the Alberta Alliance Party. They're saying, no, we have this vessel and we're just going to take over that vessel. Yeah, I, I would agree. Now, let's talk about some of the funding here, because now you, this wasn't in your op ed, but you did tweet about it. And that is Chip Wilson, who's the yeah. Vancouver based billionaire <laughs> and the founder of Lululemon. Uh, has a foundation and apparently Take Back Alberta gets a considerable amount of funding from that foundation. I, I think it's a combination of receiving money from big donors and small donors. Um, so this is not an AstroTurf organization, in my view, where they're just getting money from, from Chip Wilson and the Pacific Prosperity Fund. But they're also not a pure grassroots, you know, pass around the bucket of uh, the empty bucket at, at the uh, the church basement type of approach. It's a combination of the two. And you need those two because the big donors really provide that that financial nest egg. But the small donors provide you the organizational heft that you need to be able to do these things. Right. So a million dollars isn't going to drive 800 people to show up in in a um, uh, auditorium to participate in a nomination race, um, you need those small donors, but you also need that larger financial thing. So it's a it's it's a hybrid, right? Now let's talk about what these folks actually stand for, because I did an interview with you uh, after Danielle Smith became the leader of the UCP and then the, and the Premier of Alberta, and you talked about her being radicalized by the anti-vax, anti-mask movement. And she, since she's become Premier, I mean, there's the Sovereignty Act, there's all there's R Star, there's all sorts of really, really controversial, far right kind of policies and strategies at work here. And it seems to me that Take Back Alberta is even further right than that. Oh, I mean, this absolutely. Is... Absolutely. And so you talk about the radicalization of Smith, as I have, but there's been lots of people who've been radicalized. The uh, What Parker has done is been able to organize those people into a collective force. Um, and I mean, he didn't just emerge on the scene. He's been around conservative politics for, for a while now, but he saw this opportunity. And so it, it's, it's a focus on, you know, they talk about freedom, but it's all about COVID, but then they expand that. They expand that into a variety of, of other issue areas. And here's the other thing is they're not going to stop with the UCP and provincial politics. They're talking about um, town councils and school boards, which typically have low rates of voter turnout. So if you can mobilize a small group on a slate, uh, it, it works. We've had attempts at big city uh, slates, you know, take back city council, for example, emerged in the 2021 Calgary election. They were unsuccessful. They were unsuccessful because the size of the city of Calgary is, is so difficult to, to do. And these weren't particularly good political operators. Parker is, and he knows that, you know, he, he can do this in various reeves and counties and, and small towns um, that will be quite effective. And you can imagine if you got a small majority for the Smith government after May 29th, that's overly dominated by a rural caucus that are members of Take Back Alberta or endorsed by Take Back Alberta, how much of their agenda is going to get through. So you're not hearing much about a provincial police force or a pension plan or our star or the sovereignty act if smith wins wait till june and you'll start to see these things uh roll itself out because that's what they believe in um and you know the phrase take back alberta who are they taking it back from you know is always an interesting question they say they're they're taking it back from elites 
Okay, so that's one group. And apparently I'm now an elite and they're taking back <laughs> this from me. I wish I had the sort of power that I'm being described at. Uh, but I, well, but they're also talking about we have to take it back from progressives and liberals. And, and people think, well, the conservatives have been in power most of the last 80 years outside of about four. They don't mean necessarily partisan labels. They don't see Jim Prentice as a conservative. They don't see Alison Redford as a conservative or Ed Stelmack as a conservative, or quite frankly now, Jason Kenney or Jason Nixon, who I thought were pretty conservative guys are not conservative. And um, some of the people they're targeting incumbents just happen to be visible minority women as well. You know, so there's a reason that Rajan Sani isn't running again. There's a reason that Leela here isn't running again. Um, you know, so, and when you look at, at screenshots of their meetings, it tends to be old and white. Is it a coincidence, Dwayne, that we're seeing similar kinds of strategies down in the United States from Donald Trump's Make America Great movement again? They're targeting school boards. They're targeting local uh, local politics. Uh, well, when you go right back to what I said, taking over of an existing party, um, Donald Trump has taken over the Republican Party. There were positions that the Republicans used to have um, that they completely flip-flopped on. The, the, the Republicans used to be a believer in free trade. They used to want to confront authoritarian regimes. Um, they don't do that anymore because of what Donald Trump has done. Um, and so it's not just going after <clears throat> the school boards and et cetera. I think it is an example of, of how Trump essentially took over the party. They don't have a Trump-like character here. Um, I, I don't think any, there are no other Trump-like characters besides Donald Trump. But what they're doing is looking at that playbook and trying to replicate it in a Canadian model on a riding by riding basis. And at and at school boards and, and local governments. Now, some of these, uh, some of the folks associated with uh, Take Back Alberta have a bit of a, a history here. And I'm thinking, uh, as you pointed out, the CFO, Marco Van uh, Hugenboss, I think is how you pronounce the name, yeah. uh, is facing charges uh, stemming from the Coots blockade last year. And is that just being winked at? By, by Take Back Alberta, yeah. Um, the, if you look at the organizational structure at the senior levels, these are people who participated in the Ottawa convoy and the Coots blockade and are facing serious criminal charges. Uh, but they would free, they would frame it as freedom fighters. You know, you had a situation uh, at the, the budget speech where he was introduced by Todd Lowen uh, at the budget speech. Now, a lot of the attention was on the fact that Drew Barnes uh, introduced Tamara Leach, uh, who was obviously a key Ottawa convoy organizer. But Van Hootenstaff is a was a major Coots participant uh, and is on the Fort McLeod, you know, council and, and all of this stuff. So, yeah, the connection between Coots and Ottawa and Take Back Alberta are clearly linked. I, I have to bring in here the uh, the link with the Western Standard. Oh, this is absolutely. Run, well, I just want to lay a little context here for, for our, <laughs> our viewers, Dwayne, because I've been a major critic of Derek Fildebrandt and the Western Standard. I mean, it, this is not journalism. This is just flat out uh, political activism, looks like the Rebel News and Ezra Levant, masquerading as journalism to advance a political agenda. And I, I have to say, I'm not surprised at all that they would be, Western Standard would be tightly tied into Take Back Alberta. But it's it's an interesting connection. Right. So if you were to go on the Western Standard webpage, there are Take Back Alberta ads everywhere. <clears throat> um, David Parker is a shareholder in the Western Standard. Um, the Western Standard then publishes pro TBA articles as part of their journalism. Uh, so the amount of attention that they have placed on uh, Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry, uh, that is the writing of Jason Nixon. Jason Nixon was a senior lieutenant of, of Jason Kenney and was deliberately left out of Smith's cabinet. <clears throat> he, he was up against, in a nomination battle, a guy by the name of Tim Hovind. Uh, the UCP party executive at the provincial level 
banned Hoven from running uh, for uh, various uh, racist uh, tweets and, and things like that. They're trying to overthrow that decision and they're trying to bring Hoven back and you get regular articles in the Western Standard promoting Hoven, criticizing um, uh, Nixon. So that's the connection. Like Take Back Alberta is restricted in its political advertising. Instead, it is funding a media outlet that then does stories over and over and over again on pro TBA elements. So it is, uh, it's, it's an interesting way of getting around election Alberta rules. Now, there were some polls that came out recently, and I think of uh, David Coletto's uh, polling at uh, Abacus Data that showed the, uh, the UCP sport at, at the provincial level, at the aggregate level, uh, had risen and now that basically the UCP and the NDP were tied. And they, it, it, the polls attributed that to the return of reluctant UCPers. And, yep. uh, and what do you make of that rise in the polls, the return of the reluctant UCPers, and this campaign by Take Back Alberta uh, to expand the, you know, their reach within the party? Yeah, so the reluctant conservatives seem to be coming back to Smith. They put out a, a fairly good news budget last week. They put some of the more controversial items like policing and pensions and our star and sovereignty. They put them on a shelf um, that they're not talking about. They put Smith in a bubble. Um, it's not like she's disappeared. But she only speaks to friendly audiences. She doesn't do press conferences anymore. Expect that to continue. And so that strategy has encouraged you know, ordinary voters who don't follow politics on a daily basis, but they see less you sort of wing nutty stories coming out. Uh, they see money going into education and healthcare, and they are drifting back. But under that surface, you do have uh, the, uh, the Take Back Alberta um, taking over the United Conservative Party. And I don't think enough voters are aware of what is going on. And that was one of the purposes of writing that piece, is to raise attention on this. Uh, I was in Edmonton several times last week, <clears throat> and I was having conversations with um, more moderate UCP MLAs who are very concerned about bozo eruptions during the election. Uh, by by some of these folks that that as we get closer to an election, there will be an investigation on some of these views. And will that become a problem for the party? Because that happened in 2012 with Wild Rose and Daniel Smith. And could it happen uh, again? We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I covered that election and I remember the bozo eruption very, uh, very clearly where uh, Reverend Alan Huntsberger had written a blog, you know, about the lake of fire and non-Christians being thrown into the lake of fire. It was very controversial. It lost the election for Danielle Smith. I'm not sure if a blog like that came, uh, came you know, was discovered in 2023, that it would have nearly <laughs> the same effect. It might not have any effect. On well, we'll have to see. I mean, there's a lot of things that have changed over the last decade. And it wasn't, uh, Huntsberger was the big one, but there were a bunch of other uh, bozo eruptions, including by Danielle Smith her, herself and some other candidates. Uh, so the, the question will be, if it's one candidate, no big deal. If it becomes a pattern and Danielle Smith either uh, refuses to deal with it or acknowledge it, you know, then that became, becomes the problem. It, if she had kicked Huntsberger out and he was in a non-winnable riding, that might have put the issue to bed, but she didn't. So it's going to be how many of these occur and what the response of, of Smith is uh, and, and what sort of attention you can have. But yeah, we're in a very different political environment uh, 10 years later. Uh, Dwayne, final question, we'll wrap up the interview, but you mentioned moderate conservative MLAs. Are there any left? How many are left? It seems <laughs> like they've all... Se uh, several of these are, as I said, are no longer running again. Um, and so you think about, um, you know, the, the right wingers who stood up to Kenny, they're still around and they're uh, in now more prominent positions. Todd Lowen, for example. Uh, but the, the more moderate ones that stood up, like Lila here, like Rajan Sani, like Richard Godfrey, none of them are running again, right? So there is, they are shredding that, uh, that this big tent party 
is becoming less and less of a, of a big tent. Well, Dwayne, uh, appreciate your insights as always. Thank you very much for this. Okay, you're welcome, Marco.